the, the inaccessible or sort of the septal, uh, sort of the basal septal region of the RE summit or the accessible or the more apical lateral region of the LV summit. I expect a lot of you guys to get this right. So we kind of, we discussed this a little bit here. I see the answers coming in, looks positive. All right, so well, sorry, let me go back here. Uh, so it's like a 50-50 split. Well, everybody got the Elvis Summit part, right? But uh, look at this, you have this, again, you know, this, this R, kind of almost like a, almost a monophysic R, right? there's a little bit of an S wave, which is okay, which is allowed. In V1, you got a Q in lead one, right? So all of those sort of features are suggested about the Summit. But then in terms of differentiating between the accessible and inaccessible, what do we say? We say, well, look at, Oh, by the way, the other thing is you have the slurring, right? Which is suggestive of an epicardial site as well, which is what the LV summit is. Uh, in terms of accessible versus inaccessible, we looked at the right bundle branch pattern, which is right here, which is more suggestive of, so it tells you that it's more lateral, it's closer to the left ventricle rather than right ventricle, so the right, right bundle branch pattern. The other thing is that Q wave in AVL is bigger than the Q wave in AVR, which is also suggest they were more of a lateral focus. So this is uh, more typical for the accessible uh, summit region rather than the inaccessible uh, region. So not bad, everyone got the LV summit part right. Oh, excuse me. So a lot of limitations to the ECG criteria. Uh, one of them is the morphology is very sensitive to the cordial leads. You get an EKG in clinic and the lead V1, V2 may not be placed in the exact same spot where when the patient gets on the, you know, into the EP lab. So, you know, uh, even just, you know, one inner space, uh, one, one, uh, one space below or higher V1, V2 will, will really throw off your morphology. Typically, the complex algorithms work better than the simple ones, uh, which the reverse works true. Uh, the cardiac model rotation is not uncommon, which obviously will throw off your ECG criteria. And then there's, there's uh, this description of preferential conduction between the outflow tracks, which can actually get end up pointing the operator in, 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 the, in the wrong direction. All right, so we've, we've kind of scared these EKGs a bit. We, we, we kind of have a good sense of what's going on with the anatomy here. Uh, let's start doing some actual uh, uh, imaging and, and, and mapping. So again, ice imaging, extremely helpful in these procedures to visualize the coronaries, also to determine the location of, uh, of the ablation catheter here. Okay, so I, I actually, I will say I actually recommend ice imaging for all, of, all off-road track VT cases. I use it actually routinely even for the RVOT cases, and I'll tell you why in a second. Uh, the first thing I like to do is to get the short axis view of the, of the area ground and see the left main coronary artery kind of take off here. But look what's right here. That's actually the pulmonic valve, pulmonary valve kind of coming into, uh, coming into view. So remember what I said. So this is the left main, you can see characteristically in a kind of nine o'clock position. The pulmonic valve characteristic is a three o'clock position with a short axis, this Mercedes Benz sign of the aortic valve. Uh, remember what I said that is it's, it's not that hard to underestimate the, the height of the pulmonic valve using fluoro. So if you're mapping the RVOT and you're above the pulmonic valve because you don't have a good sense of where it is using fluoroscopy, well, guess what? Your catheter is going to be right up here against the left main coronary artery. So here's a view showing the pulmonic valve. The left main, this is not a great view of the left main, but you're going to be, you're going to be right there. Here's a McAlpine image showing that. So if you come above the pulmonic valve, which is right, shown right here, you're gonna come right up next to the left main artery. Now, one of the clues to keep in mind is that if you're mapping the RVOT and you start seeing atrial signals, watch out. The reason why you're seeing the atrial signals is because you're right up against the left atrial appendage there. So you're seeing far field left atrial signals with mapping above the pulmonary artery. So if you ever see that, it's time to back off or do a coronary angiogram and figure out exactly where you're there where your left main artery is. All right, uh, so this view we already kind of talked about in the prior slide here in the bottom view, what I'm showing you is actually have an ablation catheter inside the left main, okay? I'm not recommending you do this all the time. In cardo, using cardo is kind of nice. You can actually map the left main coronary artery and actually tag it directly on your electroanatomical map. If you're using some of the other mapping systems, you don't, you don't have that luxury. 
Now, I will say that when you're doing auto VT cases and you're trying to go, uh, you pass the catheter through the aortic valve, a lot of times the catheter does pop into the left name. Uh, so you have to be, but you have to be careful when you do this, you know, I mean, these catheters can be traumatic and can actually, if you have a plaque sitting in the left name, that can, can result in disastrous consequences. Uh, you can cause, a, you know, dissection. So you have to be careful, careful when you do that. Left main is very easy to image. The right coronary artery, which is shown here, can be a little bit tricky. It's at one o'clock, two o'clock position. One way I do this sometimes if I'm having trouble imaging the, the coronaries is actually I'll do the electroanatomic map first, fan map, or the auto map, whatever you want to call it, first. And then uh, with, with, with the fan map, especially when you actually can see the fan, uh, the, 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 the fan, I should say, of the ice catheter, you can actually point in the specific structures and start looking uh, with, with more precision. You can identify a lot of these structures uh, that way. ICE is also helpful because it will tell you where your catheters are. Here's a catheter above the sinus of Alcella, here's a catheter below the sinus of Alcella. So again, ICE is very helpful here. Uh, this is just again a calpine image. Again, we talked about this. You go above the pulmonary valve, and you're going to start seeing left atrial appendage signals. This image here is showing the same thing. In the RV outflow track, if you're antral septal, you can take down the left LAD, so you've got to watch out. Uh, sorry. Let's go back here. Um, here's, an append here's a catheter, by, in the, by the way, in the left uh, atrial appendix. There's been reported cases of ablating the LV summit, which is right here, right? Right next to the left main and the proximal coronary arteries, ablating the left uh, LV summit through the left atrial appendix. I'm definitely not advocating that, but just want to let you know from an anatomic perspective where things are, it's not, you can see why, why that can theoretically be done. Here's just a, a case report showing that if you're blaming the septal horn of the of the of the RVOT, the anterior septal RVOT, you can you can cause uh, LAD coronary injury. Okay, so you've got to watch out for all those things when you're doing these cases. So the next step is uh, sort of the electroanatomical mapping. I don't always start mapping the RVOT. It's a clear cut R way to leave V1. I don't think there's any reason to map the RVOT. I mean, certainly you can do that. It's not going to take that long. But I usually start on the left side first. Um, and what I usually do is we'll start uh, with actually mapping the coronary sinus system first. I don't routinely do a coronary sinus venogram as shown here, doing this here to show you guys the anatomy of that. So here you have the coronary sinus turning into the great cardiac vein and then extending down into the anterior and ventricular vein. Uh, the LV summit would be right up around here. Now you can see that the AIV kind of turns away more proximal to the, uh, to the LV summit. This is that communicating branch that I was talking about. So it goes more subtle. So the distal branch of the GCV, the LV summit branch, the communicating branch, whatever you want to call it. It goes more subtle and runs right on top of the LV summit. So if you can get a catheter, whether it's your ablation catheter, or mapping catheter, or some type of microelectro catheter, you're going to be able to map, uh, get activation times here uh, uh, pretty, uh, pretty nicely. Next slide. Here is just a static image with the same stuff here. This is the coronary sinus turning to the GCV, EIV coming straight down. If you had the spider view here, the LED would be running right up against the AIV here. And again, here's your communicating branch running subtly in relation to the AIV. And the RAO view, by the way, the communicating branch runs below the AIV. So if, again, if you can get the ablation catheter right up against that, um, you can ablate uh, the LV summit epicardially here. Again, you cannot rely on the, uh, on the presence of epicardial fat. And again, here you see that there is, in this view, it looks like you're right on top of the LED, but in the RAO view, you're not. You always want to do two views on, on, the, uh, on your coronary angiograms to figure out if you're near a major epicardial muscle or not. So here you can actually safely ablate this uh, LV summit VT uh, uh, from the, from in, the, in the vicinity of, the, of that communicating branch. This is just sort of the, uh, the anatomic correlate showing the same thing here. This is the fat pad in place as the fat pad sort of dissected away so the catheter in the great cardiac vein actually running into the uh, communicating branch. The EIV would be going down this way. The LV summit is going to be right here. So right under this coronary circulation. So there's a, so the ablation catheter going into the great cardiac vein into the communicating branch. But again, you know, your, your, your LED is, is, is right there. So, you know, there may be fat pad on top and also even underneath the LED, but that doesn't mean that you can get away without doing a coronary angiogram. You're still obligated to do that. 
This uh, slide I'm showing you just sort of like where I place my catheter. So this is what I use to call a map it catheter. It comes with either 10 electrodes or 20 electrodes. Uh, and this is an REO view showing the map of catheters in the anterior ventricular ring, the IV. This is a HD grid catheter that is just sitting right underneath it. So again, in the REO view, going up top and down, and the REO view coming up around like this, like what you'd see with the LED doing in a spider shop, okay? The uh, MAVID catheter in this view is in that, in that communicating branch. So look what happens here in the LAO view. Instead of coming straight down, you actually go subtle. So this is where the LV summit, the epicardial LV summit is going to be. and allows you to take some recordings from there. In the REO view, the AIV would be over here, the, and the communicating branch is going to be below it. So that's another nice way of uh, getting some LV summit activation times when you're doing these cases. Again, you've got to do a coronary angiogram. In this case, in this particular case, we were right on top of the LED here in the, uh, in the spider shot, and you're pretty close to the LED in the REO view. So you, we were not able to ablate this, but, but that's okay. So if you're not able to ablate it, what are you going to do? We're not going to, we're not going to stop there. We're going to look for the adjacent structures, and that's sort of the whole point of this talk, of this talk is to look for activation times in adjacent structures and figure out where, we, where we're gonna be delivering RF. So the next step here then is to do these electroanatomical maps. Um, I, I, don't, I don't make these detailed electroanatomic maps all the time. I'm just kind of doing this just to kind of show you these anatomic relationships again, because that's what it's all about. So the current theme is all about anatomy here. So we've looked at the McAlpine images, right? We've looked at the ice imaging here. We've looked at some of the flora shots. Uh, so let's look at some of the electroanatomical imaging here. So here in the other view, you see this coronary sinus turning to the GCV, the AIV coming around on top of the, of the summit. If you were to look at a superior view, the AIV will come in the front. And here's the communicating branch. So here's the LV summit. This is your, uh, your aortic root. And the communicating branch would run right up uh, on top of the LV summit. I was not able to get a catheter in here in this particular case, but you can see if you were able to get it in there, you would come right on top of it. Um, uh, look at the RVOT, by the way. Look at the relationship of the RVOT to the uh, aortic root here. So RVOT going into the pulmonary artery. Here's a catheter actually seeing the, I believe this is a tacky cath catheter sitting in the left main. Look what happens. The pulmonary artery, as you come up and around, if you're ablating in the high up in the RVOT beyond the pulmonary valve, you're going to be right up against the left main. So here, this patient, as I said, we were sitting right, right next to the LED. We were not able to deliver RF there because we were within five millimeters of the LED, but we were actually successfully able to ablate this. So our, our activation times, what I did here is I mapped the earliest activation time in the AIV GCD area, uh, and then I ablated just underneath it uh, endocardially, and also ablated the base in the left coronary cuff, as I showed you in some of the McAlpine images, and we were able to successfully get rid of, uh, of, the, uh, of, the, of the VT here. I actually did take some activation time in the RBOT, but look how high it is compared to where I would have liked to have laid. So the RBOT times, or the pulmonary artery times, I should say, were very late compared to the AIV, and certainly, uh, certainly very late compared to the AIV, GC, the epicardial times were also later compared to some of the endocardial times and the left coronary cusp times. So this is where we ended up laying, which is not necessarily where the site of origin is, but it's the closest spot, spot you can get to and still get rid of the, uh, this LV summit uh, VT. All right. Oh, uh, I kind of threw this in here. Sometimes when you're mapping with sort of these high fidelity catheters, you'll see these pre potentials. So this is just showing this in sinus rhythm. These are pre potentials that are seen with, uh, with the uh, HD, HD grid map, uh, with HD grid catheter. These are pre potentials seen with something called a Nova Star catheter, uh, which is a cardinal specific catheter. A little unclear so what they mean. Uh, you know, these may represent sort of specialized conduction fibers. They connect the arrhythmogenic side to the side of exit. Uh, these fibers may be insulated. They may be hard to do an active uh, sort of a pace map in these regions, and may, pace mapping actually may be unreliable here. Uh, the reason is you can actually get far field capture, and, and, and that can actually uh, point you in the wrong direction. So be careful. I'm not saying that you shouldn't do a pace map. Just be careful of uh, you know, watching your, uh, what your output is set to when you're actually doing a pace map. And what you don't want to do is uh, get far field capture uh, when you're doing it in this region. Um, 
here's uh, here's the view of the uh, catheter in the uh, the Yagi sign. Here's the uh, again the uh, the map of catheter in the uh, LV summit branch. I believe it's not in the IV because in the LA overview, you see how it's not going straight down. It's kind of coming at you. It's not really going subtle. So maybe in one of the other branches, hard to know. Either way, it's in the region of, in, certainly at the cardio, in more or less in the region of the LV summit. Here's the HD grid just underneath it. Look how thick this structure can be. Can have about two centimeters here, okay? Um, what I've done here is, is, is I've actually superimposed the McAlpine images on top of what we're doing here with uh, uh, the fluoroscopic images to give you a sense of what you're mapping here. So as you come retrograde aortic here, you have the HD grid catheter just sitting endocardially. You might want to call this the left fiber stridome. Uh, you know, as you get, as you go towards the mitral valve, you go a bit more anterior from there. And this is the map of cats that are sitting in the epicardium. So again, as I said, you know, listen, if your LV, if your side of words is right here, certainly you can ablate it from the base of the left coronary cuffs. You can come on the retrograde aortic and ablate it here. You may even be able to ablate it epicardially. Uh, and in, in, in our case, obviously we're not able to do that because we're sitting right next to the, to the, the left, uh, left coronary arteries. But this kind of gives you a sense of this region uh, with the floral and the macalpine superimposed on top of each other. It gives you a sense of what we're, uh, what we're dealing with here. As far as the, uh, the actual ablation is concerned, uh, I will say one thing is again, it's, it's all about mapping in all these specific regions, finding out the earliest spot. spot. If you're able to ablate epicardially, that's great. If you're not able to play that the cardioid, then look for other regions. So my first go-to spot is again is going to be the endocardial spot. I'm very safe to ablate. One thing I will say is that if you want to ablate here and it's not the site of origin, you're close to the site of origin, you're going to need high power, high duration. So I typically will ablate at 50 watts uh, for 180 seconds. So three-minute lesions. Uh, you know you're trying to create big lesions here uh, as you ablate there. Um, so there are some predictors of whether or not the ablation in, in, in these remote sites is going to be successful. You can look at the activation time of these remote sites. If the activation time is within seven milliseconds of the GCV site or the epicardial site, you're likely able to get it. If it's, if it's a short distance from the site of origin, you're likely able to get it. So I mean, in this patient, um, you know, I mean, imagine if this is a two centimeter distance, I mean, forget it. You can ablate all you want. You're not going to be able to get a two centimeter burn through and through. Um, let's go on to the next slide here. Um, oh, yeah. So this is actually from one of our cases. This is epic endocardial ablation here, high power, high duration. So this is one of the complications you're gonna, you do need to worry about. I would recommend doing these in, 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 not in general anesthesia. Because uh, it's very important to be doing ECG monitoring. It's very important to be doing patient monitoring as you ablate these, ablate these regions. Because if someone starts having chest pain, you've got to come off. You may be uh, ablating, uh, ablating the, you know, the coronary vessels. Um, this was just a LAD spasm we realized we gave intra, uh, venous uh, intracoronary nitroglycerin and uh, resolved almost immediately uh, in, in this particular case. So I, I, think, I think that's sort of basically, I'm going to summarize here. I think, I think when, you, when you're talking about LV summit and the arrhythmias, it's all about anatomy, anatomy, anatomy. I'm not gonna, I can't stress that as more. If you understand anatomy, you understand the 3D relationship of the different structures there, you understand the fluoroscopic anatomy, the calpine anatomy, the electroanatomic anatomy, the ice anatomy, and you're able to correlate all of that stuff. This ends up being a pretty simple case and ends up, being quite a fun case, and you can actually be very efficient with this. You can get these done in less than an hour. Uh, they're not daunting. Uh, you gotta do it systematic. You can use ECG for localization, it helps you set expectations for the patients. Um, you can do systematic activation. You've gotta do this map, mapping of all the adjacent structures. Again, you can certainly map the RVOT, the RX sinuses, and the RV and the cardio that we talked about. I highly stress ice imaging here for catheter location and, and, and imaging of some of the, uh, the critical structures that, that we talked about. Remember that if you're not able to directly ablate in the epicardial region, then ablating in the adjacent structures is, is gonna be the way to go. The shorter activation time between the site of origin, the epicardial site of origin, and where you're ablating endocardially or in the left coronary cusp, 
The shorter the differences between the activation time, the more likely you're going to be successful. The shorter the, the distance is, so you're more likely to be successful. We talked about high power, high duration ablation. If you're endocardial, you can certainly, certainly get away with that. In the left corner, it costs by usually limited to uh, about 30, 35 watts. Um, you can certainly image the left main. I think if you're ablating in the left corner, it costs and you're imaging the left main with ice, that's probably okay. If you're endocardial, or if you're, especially if you're in the, in the epicardial, in the, in, the, in the great cardiac vein, you need, you know, I think you're obligated to do a coronary angiogram before you deliver RF therapy. One of the reasons is because it's ice imaging is good for a proximal coronary structure, it's not so good for some of the distal, uh, distal coronary structure. So the sort of, you know, proximal LED, proximal search, not so much easy to image uh, uh, with ice. You can see thermal facilitation when you're blade here, by the way. In fact, I did a case yesterday, it was, uh, it was an intramural foci, and I knew it was intramural because the activation times were kind of equal all over the place. It was about 20 milliseconds pqrs in the AIV GCD area. It was 20 milliseconds pqrs in the left corner. It cost me it was 20 milliseconds pqrs in the in in the endocardium. So we ablated in the endocardium first. We actually suppressed the ablation by high power high duration. We got thermal facilitation. Actually, the patient went idioventricular rhythm. We pretty much matched the exact morphology as, as the PVC. Um, and that, that just sort of supp supp you know, suppress us uh, spontaneously with time. The other thing that you may notice though is the patient comes in and they're, you're having you know, infrequent PVCs, they're able to map and then you ablate it and all of a sudden that PVC burden goes up. So again, it may also be some form of thermal facilitation. There's clearly reported cases of late success. So you watch these patients overnight, they're having tons of PVCs and all of a sudden overnight, everything just goes away. So you can certainly certainly see that as well. Uh, there, if all of this, if all of this doesn't work, then one of the things that have been described, and I think, you know, Rod Tunks talks about this, this is sort of the surgical ablation. This is your left atrial appendage here that's kind of lifted up that exposes the, the, uh, the, uh, the summit region. There's a lot of different, you know, strategies that, that, that folks have talked about. The only one that I really tried in this region is the half an hour saying, I know that, um, uh, that's something that has been described. I think Bill Sauer's on the line here. He's, he's, he's talked a lot about this. Uh, the irrigated needle, we've tried that in, in intramural V2. We've not tried this in this, this region. I don't know if Bill Stevenson has, has tried this in this region or not. Uh, that would be a good question for me to ask him. Uh, the the, the WashU group with Phil Cuckoo should certainly try to lay in with, uh, you know, with, or with, 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 with radiation here. Um, uh, and, and, and they've had some success with that, and there's some of the other more sort of uh, kind of exotic approaches that I don't really know too much about, but if, uh, if our panel here knows enough, then please by all means, uh, happy for uh, to have them comment on it. So I think I'll, I'll stop here. I'm going to thank you for your time, and uh, I think we, we have about nine or ten minutes here for plenty of time if there's any uh, questions. Thanks. I'll hand it over to you, Michelle. Oh, that was great. Uh, amazing images. Thanks so much for that. Um, there were a couple questions here. I, you touched on some of them just there on that last slide, but um, one of them was your settings within the coronary venous system. How high are you willing to go and how long are you willing to ablate in there? Yeah, um, so I, I try in the coronary venous system, I'm usually around that 25, 30 watt range. Um, you know, as far as, I mean, we're not, we're not doing high, you know, we're not, we're not going to be delivering sort of high length. We're not going to do three minutes in the coronary venous system. So about 30, 30 seconds, we'll, you're watching everything, you're watching the patient because you can still be in your coronary vessel. Uh, but I usually will do 30 seconds of RF, about 25, 30 watts, and then reassess. Okay, great. And then this other question is, um, uh, you touched on this as well, but if the timing on adjacent structures are is not that good, but anatomically it's directly across from where you've gotten good timing, is it still worth ablating there just to try and get suppression? Oh, abs absolutely. I mean, I think that's that's one of the major points of this talk. So, I mean, look at this case right here. Can you guys still see my screen here or not? I'm not sure. Uh, can you guys still see my screen, Nishan? Yeah, we can see it. We can okay. see it. Yeah, I mean, look at this case. This is the earliest activation time here was in the EIV. Basically, I was able to eliminate this, this, this PVC from endocardial ablation. This was right on top of the coronary artery. 
So absolutely, that's the whole point is that you, you map all these regions, you get the activation time from all these regions, and then you're gonna deliver. If you're, if you're able to bit in the epicardial region, you have great activation times, then by all means, you're away from a, of the coronary vessel by all means, but if you're not able to do that, that's when you, when you have an understanding of the anatomy here, you can exploit that and ablate these LV summit VTs from ablating all these other regions, absolutely. All right, great. Uh, Jeff Winterfield says hello. Um, Hi, Jeff. <laughs> if there's any other comments anyone wants, oh, here we go. So can you use a cryo catheter in the AIV if the LAD is close? Uh, I don't have, you know, I can tell you the it's not, not, not a cryo, it's certainly been reported. Uh, remember the AIV is a region where you can, you have pretty low flow, you can get high impedance and that can be, that can, um, limit you know, how much RF you can deliver there. So it's, there's still even reports of doing that. I don't, I don't have a lot of experience with that. I don't know if uh, anyone in our panel, panel here has experience with blading with cryo in the AIV. I, I personally don't have any experience with it, but I know it's been reported. 